Hello, everyone. You are listening to our future past, the Early Music Podcast. This series is produced by REMA, the European Early Music Network. I am Yasmina Cernčić, and in this episode, we will imagine what an early music concert could look like in the future. I am not talking about a futuristic concert with holograms and high-tech add-ons, but about what we can expect to happen in the coming years if we look at the natural evolution that the concerts have undergone in the past years, following the evolution of the world we live in. So just like the early music movement looks at tradition with a critical eye, we will question the traditional format of the concert and see how it works today. The circumstances in which we listen to this music nowadays has to be very remote from the context in which you could originally hear it. Most of the time, we listen to Purcell's drinking songs or Bach's religious cantatas alike seated in a concert hall chair. This habit, that includes a social expectation and an artistic one, was formed somewhere during the 19th century, when the music that we consider today as classical music became separated from the more popular forms of music. Only a part of the population would and could attend these concerts. This applies to any musical genre in any period. Each appeals to a specific community with identified habits. Or, this is the case if no particular effort is made to challenge these habits and attract new audiences. As regards the innovation of the concert's shape, early music today faces two challenges. First, its audience is aging. For many reasons, the younger generations do not seem so interested in this type of concert experience. Today, the concert-goer's social or geographical origin and age are a main focus in a venue's plan for developing audiences and welcoming new ones. The second challenge is that early music is the music of the past, a closed corpus of works that cannot be massively extended. There may still be a fringe of live composers working with early music, with new scores to be discovered, but the main body of available concert programs is more or less stable, and yet programmers enjoy this as a playground with limitations, but also opportunities. Let's start this episode with a few words from Bernard Foucroul, who you already heard in a previous podcast. Bernard is the founder of Reseo, a network focused on the developing and involvement of new audiences in the opera sector. There is a a, a key question to me, that is addressed not only to the early music, but also to uh, the classical music in general and the opera field. It's a question of the audience. Who is audience? our audience? Who is not in our audience? And what do we do to enlarge substantially this audience? Let's look at the age of our audience. And certainly regarding opera, it's a big problem because if we don't take some specific measures, we don't have young people coming by themselves. But we know also that there are some opera houses that where 25 or maybe 30% of the audience is made of young people. So it is possible. And when I go to Lyon or Strasbourg or Rouen, I see these young people just enthusiastic about what they hear, what they see. And I think it's not only an audience for the future, it's the best audience today. I think there is a sort of an obligation as organizers today that is to to try to go in the direction of, of the people who by themselves would not come to our concerts and performances. I'm speaking about young people, uh, about uh, kids, about students, about young people, but also about adults, and and sometimes also about old people. And uh, in my uh, experience, every time we welcome a new audience, it's something special for them and for the artists. So I think we, we get this privilege of sharing what we love with people who don't know about it, but who will be even more moved by the beauty of it than the people who know it very well. Um, and uh, I think this is a very important invitation, I think, for our uh, cultural world 
to work very fundamentally about those aspects and try to involve the audience in the most active way possible. We are not only performing music for passive spectators, but we are also trying not only to get them moved, but also to maybe take something from their own creativity. If that happens, I think then we really have reached the core of our mission. Personally, I, I am convinced that the creativity is not limited to the, the composer or the author of an artistic work. I think the, uh, we have a good example of creativity with the performers. A singer, a conductor, a musician, they are not maybe the composers of the piece, but they are part of the, of the creative process. And that creative process doesn't stop with the professionals once. But I think that creative process is including also those who are coming to listen to it and to take something of their own world, of their own sensitivity uh, to it. And it gives a director of a festival or director of, of an orchestra another sense of, of uh, responsibility because we have to make sure to create the conditions so that each part, each spectator is seen as a participant in the creative process. I think if we look at that in those terms, I think it opens a lot of perspectives that go far beyond what we can see today. And I very much believe that with uh, recent experiences that has been made in, in the field of opera, I am speaking, for example, about the Birmingham Opera Company, who is doing with Graham Vicker a fantastic job in bringing new communities to opera, but also in participating actively in opera. And uh, they, ha they are now all throughout Europe a lot of, of uh, wonderful uh, realizations of the same kind. I think there are many ways to, to, to renew the, the form of the concert, and they can be uh, visual elements, they can be, uh, you, you can uh, have the, the performers moving, you, you can have uh, the audience uh, moving. My main point would be about participation. And my main point would be that you can be extremely involved, actively involved on your seat if you are concentrated and if you get the best conditions possible to, to listen to music. Um, and maybe this is the core of, of the thing, that we should not only uh, look for things that would be superficially involving people, for example, I think every time that an audience has the opportunity of singing together, can be singing the chorales in a cantata or a passion of Bach, or singing, I don't know, there are many things possible to, to, to imagine. Every time, then you listen differently because you have been part of the process. I think we are at the beginning of a new period of time where all these things can be experimented in a new way. But I very much hope that listening to music will uh, always be quite an active process, even if it's quite static, but from, inner, from the inner side. So Bernard Foucroul is giving examples of opera projects that are absolutely relevant to the early music sphere's current challenges. How do we broaden the scope of the active audience? If we cannot just expect people to show up because they are used to it, how do we create a new habit? With new audiences, you are working with a blank slate, which can be exciting because you can offer them any connection with the music and the performance. Our next guest today is ZAMUS, the Zentrum für Alte Musik in Cologne. 
This is a unique place, which is more than a concert hall for early music, as they provide performers all year long with working spaces, resources, and a network. In Samos, the audiences participate more than by attending concerts. They offer encounters with performers and are implementing an innovative, hands-on music education project. It is an open place for artists and audiences alike, and the common point is early music. So welcome Melanie Froli, manager of Zamus, and Ira Givor, who is the new director of Cologne Early Music Festival, which is organized by Zamus. Though this interview was recorded before the festival had to be cancelled, the vision that he shares here could be an inspiration for many editions to come. The main idea is that early music performance is a very modern art form. And whatever we do, we do it now and here with our tools and understanding. Of course, we try to understand and learn as much as we can about how it was. But the fact we are doing it now and today already makes it belonging to the 21st century. So by the end of early music, it means the beginning, the beginning of now. On a very philosophical level at one point and on a practical level on the other hand, Can you give us an example of what you have planned for the next edition of the festival? Our um, opening night, we are conducting a little experiment. Uh, we have commissioned um, four pieces from living composers that will be written in early music style. Um, it means people that will write in the style of Bach and in the style of uh, Handel and in the style of Monteverdi. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe. We actually don't know what will come out because those are new, new old pieces, so to speak. And they will be played without a program, without an evening program, uh, with other three real Baroque pieces that might sound a bit modern to their time. So like Baroque pieces that are a bit unusual. And the audience will have to decide for itself or will be able to decide for itself which pieces were written today or which pieces were written in the past. And so it's a little mind game of like you really have to listen with your ears without knowing and to see how you feel about it. And then in the pause of the concert, we will, of course, uh, reveal the, the truth. And yeah, I'm curious how... <laughs> how the audience will react, how the composers will react, how the musicians will react. So you obviously have plans for your audience. Being closely involved with your community must give you access to a lot of knowledge about their habits, why they come to you, what they're looking for. Can you tell us more about it? I think we have a lot of different people in our audience. For example, some people who are really fans of early music, for example, they know almost everything about early music and they wanted to hear something specific and to ask a lot of questions about how we can play the music and which kind of instrument and things like this. But we also have a young audience who just want to discover the music and just want to try different kind of concert. For example, we had last year some kind of concert with early music and poetry slam slammer, I think mm -hmm. it's the same thing. And we also have people who just wanted to hear the poetry slammer, but they also discover early music. Um, it was a new thing for them and I think they will come to the next concert. And it was really like this because Three weeks after this, we also meet them in a concert only with Bach and things like this. So I think there is a lot of different people who are coming together. What about the concert venues themselves? How do you work with pre-existing halls and churches and make them feel fresh and neutral for the audiences and performers? We really try to strive towards not playing only in churches and concert halls. However, reality is stronger than <laughs> what one wants, and in Cologne it's not so easy actually to, to find these kinds of, uh, of locations. Yes. We are trying to think about the concept, to think about the acoustic, but also to think about the audience, and we are trying yeah. to find a lot of different places. For example, last year we were in um, Planetarium. And it was yes. really funny because we had a lot of different people who only came to visit the planetarium 
and then they discover that there will be a concert and they was I think 200 people or something like this it was a bit crazy because it was a very mixed audience for this occasion yes and how do you involve performers do you share with them your goals concerning the renewal of the formats or do you focus on their artistic statement in the uh, Rema day, uh, day of early music we run a marathon with 12 concerts around the city and in order to create that, I asked our members to send programs um, kind of matching with this idea of the end of early music and the book. And I got so many good ideas and programs that I had to really, it was difficult to choose from, from mixing Purcell with electronic music to uh, building a whole pocket theater for a concert of, with, with small children. Um, to, wow, I don't know, uh, doing a passion, a Bach, uh, Marcus passion with an actor instead of an evangelist. So it, it came in many different uh, forms and colors. Samos is really a unique organization because we are working with musicians and for the musicians. So that means it's really a bit different. And we are trying to work really directly with the musicians. So that means we have to speak with them. What do you want to do? What kind of project do you want to develop? So we are trying to find solutions together. And I also think that we have more responsibilities because we have to think of about things like uh, how can we pay our musician, what is a good way to work with musician, how can we sing about rehearsal in a good way for everybody. And I, that is really a specific thing mm -hmm. from the Tsamos. Let's go back for a minute to the way you work for your community's audiences, in particular the youngest ones. As a major cultural institution in your city, I imagine you're implementing many educational actions can you give us an example and how you make it a part of your everyday work? We are working with a school here in Cologne and we are going every week in this school and working with the children about culture, management, or about marketing or design or things like this and they will create their own concert and present it in our festival and I think it's a real chance to work on a long time with the children and not just to go in the school and do two hours a little project but really to work about two three months with the children this is maybe part of our job to take early music out of its little ghetto, uh, excuse the word, and bring it out to being a real part of the, of the music world. Because, yeah, on all the levels, the educational level, audience level, even in schools, there is some sort of, a, you know, it feels like a niche still, or a closed garden. And I think we would like to, to make it a, a valid, active part of the, the music world. We are trying to do the things that we couldn't do in the past with different ensemble or different orchestras. To try different things, to try to think not just about how many people will come to the concert, but where do we want to bring our audience or things like this. We don't want to play another patient, but we want to bring the, the audience to think a bit different about the music. For example, this concert, it's not you read that you will hear Bach and you know that you have to find it good. And we want you to hear the music and to discover it as if it was the first time. And then to think about your feeling, to think about what you would like to hear, what feelings you have. And then you can discover that it's Bach or it's someone different. But it's not that important. Yeah, it's a little bit to forget about the names and the history. It's kind of the opposite of historical performance practice, what I'm saying now, but it's really to look at it without knowing what it is and to decide, is this good? Do I like this because of what it is and not because of the heritage?
we became tradition historical performance practice today it's a very normal thing I mean there are hardly any Bach passions with modern orchestras in Central Europe it's quite rare actually to find one so kind of the revolution if I may say was uh, was successful uh, we are in the mainstream um, of and almost every big orchestra now in Germany has to know something about about historical performance practice or they have baroque bows for instance or they try to use so so it's we definitely, yeah, people, people know about it, but for the audience, I'm still not sure that it make enough of a difference. We don't try to educate our audience. It's, it's really about, about freedom yeah. for the audience. To be free from all the things you know about the early music, from all the things you know about the composer, but just to come to listen, to try to hear everything you can hear, to take everything you can take from this concert. And if you want to have more information, that's not a problem, you will get it. But at the moment where you come, just be free to hear what we are proposing to it's you. It's basically free of the 19th century ceremony that is, yeah. was, is still very strong, even in historical performance. There is a conductor, there is a stage, and the audience is separated from the stage. and. Yeah, we want to to make people kind of realize that they don't have to listen like that. And it's not about doing crazy thing or changing the music. It's only no. to present the music a bit different. And I think that it's really a question of freedom. It's actually not what we play, but how. <laughs> this is what makes something an early music performance, because Today it stretches into the beginning of the 20th century mm -hmm. on paper, but it's, it's really not about the, the pieces themselves, but about how you approach them and how your audience approaches them, that it's a two-way street. I think sometimes it's easier to sell a concert with a patient from Bach because you already know what you will get. So it's really the easiest way. But there is a lot of different concert halls who are doing this. So I think the audience don't need us to do the same thing than the other concert yeah. halls. So I see, I think when I say we have more responsibilities, it was this is my answer to the question. I have to do something specific or I have to think about my concert. I yeah. have to think about the concept behind the concert. It's not just this passive, you know, listening with polite clapping at the end. No, I want more from my audience. I want them to maybe hate what I did or at least in this way I know the music Should will be in the center. Maybe the format is wrong and it will fail. I don't know. We, we, we are trying. And if it fails, that's okay, but at least I'm sure that it will make people think about the music more. And that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the point of it. I, I really hope we will get to a situation that it's a little bit like when a pop uh, band is playing. You don't ask yourself, oh, what songs are they going to do? They don't know what songs are they going to do yet. You're, you're going to go in here and hope they will do your favorite song, but maybe they will not. And you just come because you like to see this band. So this is kind of what I, I wish we, we would have. It doesn't matter what we do, but how we do it. I go back to the sentence, but it's really very important for me. It does open the possibilities when you can listen to music with a fresh ear, without worrying about not knowing enough about it. Just letting go of the obligation to summon your brains to enjoy the music. For this, I think, we can learn a lot from the way you work with children, as an example of a uniformed audience which is currently forming its tastes and musical experience. I think most of the time for the children, they have the music they like and the other music. And it doesn't matter if it's classical, if it's reggae, if it's early music, it's just a different music and if you come and say here yeah, it's a harpsichord they just want to try it and to play with it and if they find it funny then they will do it and they will come to the concert and they will ask a lot of questions there is a reason why children cannot sit in a concert it's not meant for that and 
and it's okay, they should be moving. And uh, I, I assume a concert in the 18th century was a very loud affair. I mean, people were moving, people were, it's like, you know, Shakespeare plays in, in the globe. It was loud and, and people were a real part of it. They were so passionate that sometimes you could not hear the, the actors. I'm not saying that that's what we want, but uh, emotionally, yes, that's, that's what we want. Um, every musician had this one concert that he really felt that the audience was with him. And that's such a wonderful feeling of, of energy and like exchange of emotions that once you once had it, you want to have it again. It's a drug. Thank you, Melanie Froli and Dira Givol, for sharing how programming for Tzamos brought you to consider your audience's expectations and put into words what you want to do with it. Should we indulge them or send them out of their comfort zone? With my last guest today, we will go even further and see what happens when you shift the focus away from the artistic proposition and on the experience you're offering, and when the audience can actually behave just like in a pop concert, as Ira Givol wished for. Welcome to Tamar Brühemann, who is the managing director of Wonderfeel Festival in the Netherlands, along with George Mützartz. So I'm Tamar Brueggemann and I'm managing director of Wonderfeel. And Wonderfeel is the largest outdoor classical music festival in the Netherlands and as far as I know in Europe, with over 100 performances by over 500 musicians for almost 10,000 visitors in just three days. And we have seven stages, all with their own musical character, that are spread out over 60 acres of nature reserve in Schraveland. This is uh, uh, near Amsterdam, and they are connected, these stages, uh, via short trails. They offer something for everyone, uh, from medieval, renaissance and baroque music to minimal, from classical hits to brand new notes, from solo to symphonic, and with some lines to jazz, pop and non-Western music. Our musicians are, of course, world class and range from new talents to old hands. The program also includes, by the way, dance, poetry, uh, literature, music documentaries, a uh, walk through the nature, some yoga and, of course, various activities for uh, the children. And our audience listens uh, to all the performances uh, relaxing on the benches, on bean bags under the trees or uh, simply by lying in the grass. And to complete the, the atmosphere, we have food trucks serving pizza, beer, bouillabaisse, champagne, and everything in between. One of the characteristics, actually, of the festival, it's based on, on the formula of a pop festival. So we are selling day tickets and we have a, a full festival schedule with parallel programming. And we have a campsite in walking distance of the festival site, just like a pop festival. One of our assets and starting points uh, compared to the usual festival formats is freedom. And we see, uh, we actually see our festival as a meeting place where the public can wander around freely and to discover new things just by chance or out of their curiosity. And I think it is very important that their freedom is not hindered by the price of tickets or the need to reserve a seat. And, and just like at the pop festival, walking in and out of a performance is possible at any time. And if our visitors don't like a performance, they can just leave. We not only cherish the freedom of our visitors, but also the freedom of our musicians and curators. Our musicians are free to try out new concepts and programs and they can make use of the possibility offered by the outdoor festival site. And also the curators have, have the freedom to present their offer <laughs> suitable for the, for the various stages. We book only a few months before the festival starts, which gives them a lot of flexibility to book uh, newly discovered musicians at a very late stage. So both musicians and curators are not restricted 
yeah, by the potential saleability of their ideas. When our ticket sales actually start, at least one third of our tickets are sold without even having announced our lineup. We know this from our audience survey. And this, knowing this, it gives uh, our curators the possibility to actually present riskier performances. And we never choose uh, to invite a more popular performance because um, we want to, 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 to attract uh, more people. That flexibility of classical music was actually the starting point of Wonderfeel. We founded Wonderfeel in 2015 in order to present classical music in a new way, um, which I already told. It could be experienced in a manner that matches actually the spirit of our times, as well as the developments within our classical music scene. I think we, over the past decade, we all have seen a growing desire for innovation in the classical music sector. The 19th century infrastructure no longer always suits the creative ideas of a new generation of musicians. And classical music is increasingly performed outside the concert hall, making it, making it more accessible to new visitors and giving the musical experience a, a new dimension. We also notice that this listening experience of the visitor has gained in importance. Um, the, uh, in my opinion, the live performance developed from a, a final objective more to a means to achieve this desired experience and in which all parts of the concert attendance count. Classical music became and, and still becomes more and more demystified in a way. The distance be between creators, musicians, composers and listeners uh, is reduced. In the Netherlands, all kinds of accessible TV programs about classical music and the performers appeared. And uh, many Dutch pop festivals, such as Lowlands, Into the Great Wide Open and Down the Rabbit Hole, uh, also started to program classical music. In, uh, in 2019, I actually read uh, in The Guardian an article with the headline Young people are turning to classical music to escape noise of modern life. This craving for quality, genuineness, for living together more consciously can be well translated into a festival for classical music in nature. And the fact that it is necessary to preserve this nature by taking sustainable measures uh, is taken for granted and expressed by an ever-growing group of people, of course. Festivals as a temporary mini-society are ideally suited to test and also to implement new and sustainable ideas. And do the audience's numbers and behavior compare to what you can see in a pop festival? In 2019, we almost had uh, welcomed 10,000 people at the Wonderful site and this amount consisted of 1,100 children and 400 uh, students. Uh, the average age was uh, 54, and our audience surveys reveal that 85% visit more than five concerts per day, uh, which actually comes down to more than 50,000 concert visits in total. And our surveys shows that 65 of our adult visitors hears music that they would normally never or barely listen to, and actually 51% never attends a festival. But was persuaded by Wonderfield's concept. And over 10% never even go to classical music concerts. Never, ever. And 85% believe that Wonderfield makes classical music more accessible. And I think, I really believe that the connection between and close proximity of the performance and the audience, together with the casual atmosphere, is crucial for that experience we want to achieve with our audience. In 2016, uh, the wonderful pianist Pavel Kolesnikov, he wrote on his blog, summer festivals are risky, all the terrible stuff, open air, minimal rehearsals, thousands of people, food, hippie, and a hundred concerts happening in three days. A perfect horror movie for me. I was wrong. It is a simple and reliable model of paradise. And in 2018, countertenor Martin Engeltjes uh, said in an interview, and, and I paraphrase him a little bit, 
the setting sun and the smell of grass create an atmosphere you won't find anywhere else. Classical music must be taken out of the norm of perfection. The experience is also important. Don't get me wrong, at normal concerts that is equally important. But we as classical musicians are so afraid to make mistakes. In pop music you don't hear anybody about this. For pop musicians all that matters is whether the audience has felt it. That is ultimately what you want to achieve with music. With Wonderful we also want to have uh, an impact on people's mind. And um, I think at, at, at Wonderfeel, as, as actually at any festival, our visitors are, are briefly detached from their daily lives and habits. And uh, of course, from their usual time experience and their normal occupation and use of space. A festival is actually a, a temporary society on, on scale, their temporary society on scale, and um, where we can share our ideals and dreams uh, about the future. And I hope that at Wonderfield we give our musicians and speakers the opportunity to share uh, their stories and their interpretation or, or reflection of our time. Last year I, I attended uh, the award ceremony um, of the Erasmus Prize which was awarded to composer John Adams. And during uh, this ceremony, he said, and it's a beautiful quote, I think, in a period of social upheaval, like what we are currently experiencing, one that is restless and unstable, both politically and culturally, many artists feel impelled to turn their activity outward, to take a stand and to use whatever communicative powers they possess to address the crucial issues that affect us all. One might imagine that because the current mood, not only in the United States, but here in Europe as well, is taking such a conservative turn, fearful of change and determined to preserve the status quo, so must artists feel compelled to respond by using the communicative power of art to address just those issues, whether they be social or environmental, that they feel government is ignoring. In my opinion, John Adams is exactly underlining the power we as art managers or as artists have addressing the social and environmental issues of our time and to take a stand and, and to use the communicative powers to reach our audiences. Uh, we have to use that festival format, these societies at scale, to put those social and environmental issues at the table. And of course, being an outdoor festival with a preoccupation for nature, you also work with your environment and the weather on a daily basis. How has this made you include a goal of sustainability in the concept of Wonderville? Our first uh, edition in 2015 was hit by a, a huge summer storm and we indeed had to cancel one day of our festival, resulting in a, in a huge deficit. The measures we're taking uh, f for this is, of course, we use tents so people uh, are sitting dry when, when it starts raining. It's very useful in the Netherlands. But also, on the other hand, uh, two years ago, it was very drought year and we couldn't use open fire. And we always end the day of our festival by singing together, uh, sitting around a, a campfire. This is simply, we just ad adjusted it a little bit and singing is also possible without a campfire, of course. But um, yes, weather conditions, well, determining how we organize the festival. But so is everything organizing in a nature reserve. Following the words of John Adams, taking a stand, <laughs> we couldn't organize Wonderfeel uh, without striving to preserve that same nature in a sustainable way. I mean, we have to create awareness on the use of water, energy, waste and transportation. I, I mean, we use electric cars to transport artists, but we also encourage our international artists uh, to travel by train. 
And last year, uh, all, all the musicians from London and Brussels traveled by the Eurostar. But also we increased the festival goers' awareness of our shuttle buses. And we encouraged them to, to come to Wonderful by public transport or, or bicycle, of course. And we also provide charging stations for electric cars and bicycles. Next to the transportation, we, we like to look at, at our waste as, uh, as raw material. Last edition, Wonderfield was almost waste-free. All consumables are immediately reusable or recyclable or locally compostable. Our consumption behavior not only has an impact on the environment, but also has a social impact. Thinking of fair pay and fair practice throughout the production chain of, of food and merchandise. So, of course, we decided not to sell Wonderfield t-shirts uh, made in Bangladesh anymore. But it also makes us think about uh, the production chain of our own cultural sector. I mean our musicians must, must be able to make a living from their performances. So we, the fair pay is very high on our priority list. Accessibility is also about uh, more accessibility for people, for disabled persons or single elderly people or, or even newcomers, refugees, m migrants. Many status holders have, have few opportunities to participate in, in, in the Netherlands, in, in our society, to remain active and to build uh, a new network, let alone to gain work experience. Next edition, hopefully in 2021, we will invite, in close cooperation actually with a, with a specialized organization, uh, a number of refugees to join our volunteers team. You're working with the audience's experience in mind, which is why you take such an interest in knowing your audience, where they come from before participating, but also what they enjoyed most in Wonderfield. I'm very curious to know what these surveys show regarding the people who have discovered something new during the festival. In the survey, we see, as, as I mentioned before, that 65% of the adult visitors hears music that they would normally never or barely listen to. I mean, they, they hear music that is new for them and maybe they like it. Maybe they listen to it again. At Wonderfield, there are free to have their own opinion if they if they don't like the concert they leave and if they like it they just stay at the concert and and listen to it and it's working i mean i really like that that people are listening to concerts they they would never have imagined listening to or never heard of the artist you're not buying a, a concert ticket for a completely new upcoming strange artists you've never heard of with music style you don't even heard of or never liked before. I mean, why would you spend 25 euros on that? And at Wonderfield, I mean, they, they visit like more than five concerts a day. So you have the, the time and, and the space to, to experience new things. This shows us how taking the music out of the concert hall puts the organizers in a situation where they have to look at the bigger thing and every decision they make is political, meaning that they have an impact on their community life and also on the experience they provide for the audience. This sounds like a really exciting journey, both for you as organizers and for the audience. But what about the performers? Do they feel the difference? We invite musicians that are curious about um, performing at Wonderfield, whether they uh, play medieval music or sing William Byrd Mass or play minimal uh, music by Arvo Pert or whatever. I think everything suits our festival as long as, as the performer is sincere. I mean, this, this counts for every stage, every concert hall, but especially at Wonderfield. Yes, it is different when you play Chopin's Nocturne at night and some nightingale is, is singing along. I mean, it happened. It really happened. 
everything is is giving input to their way of performancing but i think for us this in intimate atmosphere the closeness to the audience between the audience and the musician that is the most important and with the nature as a very relaxed and intensifying decor thank you for sharing with us the motivations behind your wonderful festival and describing how it works this is an excellent conclusion to this episode of the early music podcast I thank the representatives of Zamos and Wunderfiel for sharing their values with us today and explaining how their vision of the experience of music has shaped the format of their concerts. There are striking common points here. For instance, the importance of talking to a community. We also heard a lot today about how important freedom is for the audience to enjoy music, make their own minds about it, and form their own taste. This is the Early Music Podcast, and the music you have been hearing along this episode was recorded by Zamos and their performers. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Beaux-Arts in November 2020. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. The next episodes will give you an overview of the topics that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more insight into the lives and ideas of your favorite performers, to know what your favorite concert halls are up to these days, and get to know in advance what you can expect for the next years of live or recorded music and exciting research projects. See you next week for more episodes. Mm -hmm.